Well, last week we celebrated Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. There we go. Uh, it's a wonderful day to have you with us here in worship today. Uh, we actually wrap up our sermon series from uh, the beginning of the Christmas season all the way to today. We've been going right through the whole book of Luke. Um, working our way through the entire book. And so we celebrated on Easter what Luke had to say about the resurrection. And now we just have that last little bit of Luke, about 40 verses, and then we're done with Luke. Um, and so the highlights from Easter, if you missed it, if you weren't with us, here's the, the snapshot. Jesus is alive. That's the good news. That's what we celebrate today and always. Jesus is alive, and that's what we celebrated on Easter. And so today we finish up the book of Luke. And the big question is this. Last week, we talked about Jesus rising. That was Easter. What now? Now that, now that Jesus has risen from the dead, now that he has shown that he has that power, now that he has defeated Satan and, and defeated sin and defeated death, what do we do now? What's his last message with us? And so we'll just look at what happens next. So verse 13 that we're going to pull up right now. Um, this is Easter Sunday. This is right after um, Jesus' tomb is empty and the women run back and tell the rest of the disciples, hey, the tomb is empty. They run to look at the tomb and see it's empty. This is the very next scene. This is what happens. And it says that two men were uh, walking to a town called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they're walking, Jesus himself appears next to them and starts walking with them. But here, here's the key, verse 16. Um, they are kept from recognizing him. So these, these two followers of Jesus are walking down this path to Emmaus. And Jesus himself appears and starts walking with them. And they, for whatever reason, can't notice it's him. And so they're just walking and talking. And Jesus asks them, what are you guys talking about? What are you discussing? And with their faces downcast, one of them, named Cleopas, said, Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in the last couple days? And Jesus says, What things? And he says, About Jesus of Nazareth. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem us. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place, and some of the women amazed us today. They, they said they went to the tomb this morning, and they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they saw angels who said that he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it as, just as the women had said, they did not see Jesus. And so Jesus asked them, or Jesus says to them, how foolish are you, and how slow to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things to enter his glory? And beginning with the book of Moses, so beginning with the very beginning of the Old Testament, through all of the prophets, Jesus goes through and explains to them the whole scriptures that point to him. Every sign that said this was going to happen. Then verse 28. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to keep on going. They say, hey, it's late. Come eat with us. And so he goes and eats dinner with them. And at verse 30, it says this. When he was at the table, he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and began to give it to them. And their eyes were open at that point. Not until this point just now do they finally realize, wait, that's Jesus. This guy we've been talking to for the last couple hours, that's Jesus. And, and so as soon as they recognize it, look at what happens in verse 31. He disappears. Like, I, I don't know how your dinner parties go, but when a, somebody disappears from dinner, that's pretty amazing. And so Jesus, right as they recognize it's him, disappears, and they freak out. They go running all the way back to Jerusalem in verse 33. They go running the seven miles all the way back to Jerusalem to find the 11 disciples. And they start telling them, look, Jesus is alive. He walked with us. We saw him. And then he disappeared. And so they're all talking about this. Is Jesus alive? Is he not? And then we get one of the just most hysterical scenes in all of the Bible. Except for probably the donkey that chews out his master. If you don't know that story, look it up. It's true. There's a talking Bible, and a talking donkey in the Bible that chews out its master. Go read your Bible. But this is probably second most funny story in the entire scriptures. Because what happens is they're all sitting there debating whether Jesus is alive. Now let's pause for a second. For three years, Jesus has been telling them, I'm going to be killed, and three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. 
three years he's been telling them this. And sure enough, he dies, he rises from the dead, and they're debating whether he really did it or not. And all of a sudden, verse 36, he appears among them and says, peace be with you all. And they freak out. They start screaming and yelling. They're frightened. And they start yelling, it's a ghost. Now, if you're Jesus, and you spent three years trying to coach these guys up, hey, I'm going to rise from the dead. And all of a sudden, you appear in your big ta-da moment, and they go, a ghost! What are you thinking at that point? Like, if I was Jesus, I'd be like, yeah, I, I'm just going to start over. This was a mistake. Um, and that's literally what he did. He goes, hey, guys, um, why are you so troubled, and, and why are you doubting? Look at my hands and my feet. Touch me and see. I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and bones. Touch me. And you got to imagine, like, one of them was like, you touch him. No, you touch And one of them's like, Oh, yep, he's real. He's real. That's him. That's the scene going on right now. Jesus has to be like so embarrassed and mortified. These are the guys that I'm going to leave the hands of the church to, really. And so they, they say this, and then the, the next scene is so awesome. He, Jesus says, what do you guys got to eat? And they, they go, well, we, we have some broiled fish. Like, if you're going to rise from the dead and be celebrated, like, Broiled fish, that's the meal you give Jesus after he rises from the dead and saves you? Hey, here, here's some awful broiled fish. And so that's what Jesus eats. And he says to them, okay, let's, let's start this over. Verse 44, he goes, okay, I'm going to explain it all to you again. Everything is fulfilled. And he starts with the very beginning of the Old Testament and goes all the way through the Old Testament. And he explains it all over again to them. And then in verse 50, uh, they, they start walking to uh, Bethany. And as he's walking to Bethany, he lifts up his hands and he starts to bless them. And as he does that, he begins to just ascend into the sky and he goes up into heaven. And, and he leaves them and they begin worshiping and, and praising him. And he says, go to Jerusalem and wait and the power of the Spirit is going to come. That's how the book of Luke ends. I skipped one part that we're going to come back to. That's how the book of Luke ends. And so the big question is, we on Easter celebrated that he rose from the tomb. The tomb was empty. And now we see he, he's risen from the dead. People are seeing him, interacting with him, talking with him. And for 40 days, he spends time with them. And, and the big question is, is this. Um, what does this mean? What, what impact did this have on my life? Because if you're like me, when I hear a story like this, this is what I want to know. What, what does that mean for me? Tell me what I need to know. How does this impact my every day? And how this impacts our every day is this. If we believe this is true, if we believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior, that he really did rise from the dead, that's all the scriptures say we need to do. Believe that it's true, and these things come to you. And the first one is this, that sin and Satan are conquered. You see, what Jesus rising from the dead and proving to them, touch me, look at me, see, I'm alive. Well, the first thing that this does for us is it tells us that sin and Satan are conquered. That Christ is victorious over sin and Satan. That we have our sins atoned for. Which means this. You are a new person in Christ. When Jesus says you are forgiven and you are redeemed and you are rescued from sin, it means that you are a new person person. That people from your past can come up to you and go, no, I remember what you did. I know what you've done. I'm with you on the weekends. I see who you are. And you can say, you know what? Because of what Jesus has done, I'm a new person. That's not who I am. If we simply accept the free gift of Jesus, this is what it happens. We become righteous. Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And it was actually, the words he used was like a, a transaction complete. This was your sin. This was the debt you owed. I paid it. All's forgiven. Everything is able to be forgiven. And it works in the future. It works in the past. And it works in the present. And you are forgiven of the sins you remember. You are forgiven of the sins you forget. You are forgiven of the ones you've done. And you are forgiven of the ones you are going to do next week. You are are forgiven. Your sins are paid for. And so what's awesome about this is a lot of times people get Jesus wrong. A lot of times people think Jesus is sitting there saying, 
Let me condemn you. Let me tell you about your sin. Let me give you guilt. Let me give you shame. But Jesus is actually saying something much different. Jesus is encouraging us to righteousness. The Bible tells us that he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so this is how it works. When you are saved, when you believe in Jesus and you are a Christian, you begin to sin and Jesus comes to you and goes, hey, 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 that's already been paid for. That's not who you are anymore. And we as righteous people, we begin to sin and Jesus comes to us and he says, no, no, no. Don't do that through your conscience and through that nudging of your spirit. He says, don't do that anymore. That's not who you are. That's the old you. That's your old appetites. That's your old desires. You know those won't fulfill you now. That's not who you are anymore. Don't do that. You're a righteous person. That's who we are. And see, the Spirit of God does not move and say, look how bad you are, look, you did it again, guilt, 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 shame, 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 judgment, judgment. That's not the Spirit of God. That's Satan. Satan wants you to feel terrible about who you are. Satan wants you to be ashamed of who you are. Satan wants you to be downcast all the time thinking you're a failure. Christ is the opposite. Christ says, I've redeemed you. You are righteous. You are a new person. Sin and Satan are conquered. And the chains that they had over your life are freed. You are freed from them. You are free. The second thing that that this means for us is that death is conquered. I think if we we all sat down and talked, almost every single one of us fears death, even if we're a Christian. Even though I know that the Bible tells me that on the moment I close my eyes and take my last breath, that I will wake up in heaven and seated in front of the throne of God, even though I I believe that with my whole heart and the scriptures tell me that's true, I, I still fear dying. I don't think that's going to be a pleasant experience. But what this verse tells us is we don't need to fear because death has been conquered. Jesus rose from the dead in person. People saw him. It changed the world. And he says, if you believe in me as your Savior, you will too. You will live forever with me. That death is just the beginning. We we live this life right now and die. And then forever, all the way going on and on and on, We will live with him. He says this is just the beginning. And death is just a passing on to the life to come that we will have forever. And so death is conquered by Jesus. And the third thing that that all this tells us is that the Bible is true. You see, if you go back to the very beginning of the Bible in the Old Testament, it promises that Jesus is coming. It promises that he is going to be born of a virgin. It promises that he would live a sinful life. It tells us that he would be a teacher and a healer. It tells us that he would be put to death and that he would be buried and he would take our place for our sins. He would be our Savior. And then it says that three days later he will rise from the dead as he promised, as the Bible says and Jesus himself says. And what this tells us is the Bible is true. It all happened just like the Bible said it would. It was all promised and it all happened. And now we step back and we await for the fulfillment that he will come again. But what Easter, the biggest impact of Easter is this, that sin and Satan are conquered, that death has been conquered, and that the Bible is true. And so when we look back and we say, okay, I understand the impact of what Easter has given us, but what do we do now? What do, what's the next step? And the Bible is very clear on this. The next step is to tell people. The next step is to simply tell people this. And Jesus says this himself in the part that we, we skipped over. And, and I highlighted it here. Jesus opened the, the mind so that they could understand the scriptures. And then he said this. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all the nations. This is what we do with the rest of our lives, is we are to tell people, look, Jesus rose from the dead, and that's good news because we are all sinners, 
and we all need forgiveness. And, and I know that's not a, a very fun thing, a very sexy thing to tell people. Like nobody wants to be the person that walks around and go, hey, you know what? You're kind of a failure and messed up. But good news, so am I. But that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to tell people about what sin is. And sin is thoughts, words, actions, motives that go against the way God calls us to love and obey. And there's sins of commission, which is things we do that we shouldn't do. And there's sins of omission, things we know we should do that we don't do. And the Bible says all of us, every single person in this room, whether you want to admit it or not, all of us do this. All of us sin. And we like to blame other people for our sin. We, we say it's our parents' fault or it's culture or it's my genetics. You know, I'm just built that way or, or personality type or experiences or woundedness. This happened to me, so, so therefore I get to do these things. We excuse sin away. We, we say things like, well, nobody's perfect or, you know, I was just having a bad day or I'm going through a hard time or, you know, this and this happened, so I, I did this. Or we try and deny our sin. We say, well, I, I don't think it's that much of a problem, or it's not as bad as you say it is, or it's not hurting anybody. But what God tells us is all of us are in sin. And the world needs to know, because here, here's the big point, guys. If you don't understand your need for a Savior, then He's not very much of a Savior. If you don't understand what it is that He's saving you from, then what good is it? The good news of the gospel is that all of us are sinners. All of us fall short. All of us are messed up. All of us are broken. All of us need redemption. All of us need to be saved. If you don't understand the first part, then the second part makes no sense. Hey, you're saved. From what? I don't need to be saved. And so as much as we Christians get labeled as judgmental and, and, and always pointing out people's faults, there is a way to go about it that's wrong, but our calling is to go first, to say, hey, I'm a failure, I mess up, I fall short, but this is the good news of the gospel is that God paid the price. And what he calls us to is repentance. What Jesus wants us to teach the world is how to repent. And what repentance is, is, is this. Repentance is not meaning I got caught, so I'm gonna say sorry. That's not repentance. Repentance is your own heart saying, I want to come clean. I want to come clean. Not because I was caught. I have apologized a lot of times when I was caught. But that's not repentance. Repentance is, without you even knowing, I want to come to you and come clean. And repentance is four things. First, it's conviction. And whether it comes from hearing a sermon or reading the Bible or just the Holy Spirit working on you, Conviction means a, a recognition that you were wrong. And sometimes you can see it on the face of the person that you just crushed with your words or your actions. Sometimes you just look back at the wreckage of your life and say, I've done this. This was me. I did this. And it was me alone. And, and sometimes people don't want conviction um, because they, they think, well, it's going to lead to depression or it's going to lead to, to self-esteem issues. But conviction is a healthy thing. Being able to walk away and say, I did this, I messed up, this is my fault, is a healthy place to be. Because then it leads to the next point, which is confession. What God says is once you've realized, I did this, this is my bad, this is my wrong, you go to him and you say, God, it's my fault. I am sorry, I did this, and it's a big deal. I'm not going to make excuses, it's a big deal. And then the next part is contrition that we actually feel the weight of what we've done, that we feel that remorse to say, this was wrong, and it hurts me that I've done this. And the last part of uh, repentance is change. God, I don't want to do this again. I don't want to want to do this again. Change my heart. And here is the most incredible part, is Jesus says, when we hit this point, almost all of us are going to say, I feel like I need to do something. I feel like I need to make this right. I feel like I, I need to pay for this somehow. And at that point, he's going to go, yeah, it's already paid. Thank you for feeling the weight of this. Thank you for apologizing for this. Thank you for asking to change. But the price, the punishment has already been paid. It's already covered. And we get to receive forgiveness. Wholehearted 
forgiveness. And we are completely forgiven. How many of you, when someone you know tells you they forgive you, um, they still like to bring it up whenever it's convenient, and they still like to hold it over you whenever it's a good time? Don't raise your hands. That's not how God works. When God says it is completely forgiven, it's gone. You know how you have a whiteboard at school and sometimes you can write on it and you erase it and you see, see the words? Like that's kind of how we think of it. Like I did it, but it's still kind of there. I see. God says, no, 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 it's gone. Completely clean. I, I liken it to this. When we, when we say, okay, so if I'm completely forgiven and I repent and we tell the world this, how are we, what do we do next? I, I liken it to this. Um, how many of you have ever thought about what you would do if you won the lottery? Raise your hand. Anybody? Wow, nobody, okay. I, I think about that. Um, I could tell you, if you dropped $10 million on my plate, I could tell you what I would probably do. I would travel. I, I know. I, the next month, you would not see me. I would, I, I'm like, I'm going to Europe, and I'm going to New Zealand, and I'm going to go to eat barbecue in Texas, and I'm going to, I got my plans. Like, I'm ready. But here's the thing. After a month of that, what are you going to do? Like, that's the cool part of thinking about winning the lottery is if I don't have to do a job, if I have no obligations, if everything is covered, everything is paid for, everything is, is set, what would I do every day? Would you go play golf? I know Dave would. Would, would, you, would you just go work at an ice cream shop for free and just hand out free ice cream to kids? I mean, what would you do if you had no obligations, no needs, and you just got to live in joy? What would you do? Because what Christ invites you to is that. Christ says so many of you think that you owe somebody or you owe me. And with your life, you're constantly trying to prove yourself to somebody, somebody that you live with, somebody that you know, a parent that's already deceased, that you're constantly trying to prove yourself to. Or to God, you say, well, I did this, so God, I got to do this to prove myself to you. And God says, look, it's all paid for. It's already done. You're already free. So go live in joy. What Christ invites you to is to go live in joy. You have no obligations on you. Your sin is paid for. You owe nobody anything. You are forgiven. So what would you go do? What would your heart's passion be to go and do? He says, go and do that. And do it to my glory. And when people ask, say, you know what? I'm forgiven. I was a mess. I was a wreck. I was a, I was a mess. But I'm forgiven and I'm free. And so I'm just going to live in joy. That's what we're invited to do. But here's the thing, guys, and I want to invite the band to come on up and get ready to sing. We don't get to live in joy until we understand what it is we've been rescued from. And others will not know how good the gospel is until they understand what they've been rescued from. And so what I'm going to invite the band to do is play a song here. And this is our song of confession today. It's our time to get right with God and to give it all to God. Because as soon as we can get that weight off our chest, those things that you say, God would never forgive me of these things, or nobody knows about this, and this is some secret sin that I have. And God says, get it off your chest. Get free of it. And live with joy. Owing nobody anything. And just go live. And so I want to invite you to hear this song now.
There's a light of hope that shine. Won't you come and take your place? And bring it all to the table. It's nothing he ain't seen before. Please pray with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you, and Lord, we are all fallen. We are all broken. And Lord, you offer to take our shame. You offer to take our guilt. You offer to take our sin away. Lord, no matter what we've done, you've already paid for it. You've already forgiven it. So let us confess it to you now, and let us hear that forgiveness spoken over that. Let us get right with you in this moment as we quietly to, our, to ourselves and to you, God, confess. Lord, hear our prayer. Convict us where we need convicting. Lord, let us confess to you and let us be changed by you. Let us run to you with our sin so that we can leave forgiven and free. All this we lift up in your holy name. And God's people said, amen. On the cross, Jesus said, it is finished. Done. Paid for. You get to walk away from this place right now free, having nothing held against you in this life, because your Savior 
paid the price for you. And I get the incredible joy of announcing to you that you are forgiven. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Please rise as we sing.